Well, this is a wonderful occasion for me, even if I'm looking slightly ridiculous with this uh, various, um, what might look like an out of space uh, present on, on that. But it's fantastic that I'm privileged to be here and listening to great music and some very moving talks, which is, um, uh, uh, just make one proud of what Stefan has achieved and the loyalty he inspires among his um, students and friends and everyone. Um, I came to know Stefan Klassen more than a quarter of a century ago. It was 1990 and I was one of the two examiners of his senior honors thesis for his BA degree from Harvard University. In that hugely impressive thesis, Klassen applied what economists call, I quote, a computable general equilibrium model. Um, I'm not going to explain it and he applied it to the analysis of agriculture in Bolivia. Two things were immediately clear to me as I read his splendid economic analysis. He hadn't done the work with me, I was just his examiner. First, that I'm dealing with a totally brilliant student, and second, that Stefan Klassen must be, absolutely must be, rescued from the arid ground of computable general equilibrium <laughs> model building. <laughs> the rescue was needed not because Claire Klassen's um, reasoning was not powerful, it was in fact extremely robust within its context. The need for rescue arose precisely because Klassen's extraordinary skills were manifest in the thesis. I ask myself, with a mind like that, why is this totally exceptional young economist following the disastrous practice common in the teaching of modern economics of persuading the brightest of students to work on the remotest of problems? Sure enough, general equilibrium of competitive market is a great subject to study for any economist seeking clarity on mark, how markets are supposed to work. But doing the exacting calculation of applying that theory to real life problems, whether in Bolivia or elsewhere, is a gigantic leap into an imagined land. Klassen, of course, knew all that, but the exercise was still one which would bring him credit, well-deserved credit, for addressing a complicated analytical, mathematical, and computational problem. Indeed, computable general equilibrium does demand technical skill, which Stefan Klassen had plentifully. I did not have the slightest hesitation as an examiner in giving Stefan the highest mark, summa cum laude, that Harvard can bestow on his student. He also got the Allen Young Prize for the best senior thesis that year among all Harvard students. But why use such an extraordinary mind with exceptional skills to get small answers to tiny questions using a model of market relations that strays far away from the actual markets, not to mention actual economic and social relations that could be found anywhere, whether in Bolivia or in Germany and the United States. Uh, I did check with Stefan that his supervisor, Shanta Devarajan, isn't here, because <laughs> I would have lost a friend if I said this. <laughs> I much enjoyed the discussions that followed about with Stefan about what he was going to do. 
now that he had got his VA. After some discussion, Stefan chose um, in various form, but ultimately it, 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 it uh, equilibrated on gender inequality and development strategies. He did want to work on what we may understand as a quote-unquote real problem, and going beyond that on what we may call, again quote-unquote, a world problem. As we discussed his earlier days, there were clear indications that he was inclined in the direction of taking a world view, including a real and relevantly accurate understanding of the world. Klassen's choice of postgraduate research fitted in well with his school day commitment at the United World College in Montezuma, is that right? In New Mexico, where he had been admitted as the German representative among students from 70 different countries studying in that great international school. Klassen's postgraduate work on gender inequality and development proceeded with sure-footed sure -footed mastery. And before long, we, have, we had a new leader of gender-related economics in the world. He did not take any shortcuts. His study of the present, of the challenges of high relative mortality, and that's what he, where he began, high relative mortality rates of girls and of women compared with what could be expected given the observed mortality rates of boys and men had to be found on had to be found dead on painstaking historical research of what had happened in the past of the now rich countries for example germany a century or so ago the subtitle of his thesis Lesson from the past and policy issues for the future well reflects how he had extended the epistemological basis of his work along with using the emerging knowledge to draw policy conclusions of relevance today and tomorrow. What began his doctoral work led Stefan to continue and expand and radically develop his research in his postdoctoral phase and then eventually in his academic career as an immensely influential and successful and great professor at very distinguished universities. Before long, Stefan Klassen emerged as the strongest and most clear-headed contributor to the subject of gender inequality and its policy implications, as you were quoted me as saying some years ago. He influenced research in this whole area, both to his writings, but also to his guidance on the research of others in Munich and, of course, in Göttingen particularly, but also in a number of other places which he visited, from New York to Johannesburg, from Harvard to the University of Cambridge. <coughs> where he was for two years, and before I was coming, I came directly from Cambridge, quite many people said, I must convey their greetings to, to Stefan, and how lucky I was that I was going to this, to this occasion to celebrate uh, Stefan's achievements. And I think this is a good moment to recognize and applaud Stefan's achievement on his 50th birthday. So I would invite you to join me in, in expressing appreciation. attempt to go through Stefan's publication list, but it is important to see with clarity the nature of his work. Many problems of gender inequality are easy to air as general ideas, as I had, for example, done with the idea of missing women, reflecting how many more women 
we should expect to see in different countries of the world if women's mortality rates were not artificially elevated through neglect and gender discrimination. Elevated well beyond what could be expected on the basis of biological considerations alone in which women actually have a survival advantage. As presented in 1990, some illustrative numbers of plausible figures of missing women based on very aggregate contemporary statistics. But since these numbers, uh, and I should say, by the way, that um, those numbers are easy to find. You take any kind of general statistics book, and if you haven't been able to do it in 90 minutes, you should blame yourself. So it wasn't a profound research that I did when people said your hard work on missing women it wasn't hard work. Um, but the trouble is that, as indeed was said earlier, it wasn't in any way uh, a completed exercise. Um, I think there were very aggregate contemporary statistics used for making just the point. But since this number kept being cited in different publications in the world, they came to be used well beyond their intended use, at least intended by me. And for this reason, as well as for our basic scientific curiosity about the nature of the world, as well as for policy guidance, we have to do much more detailed assessments based on a larger set of more disaggregated information and making use, and this was one of Stefan's um, 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 major um, uh, departures he introduced of making use of historical studies um, in a really serious historical way rather than just making a, a passing reference to what may have happened in history. That is one of the large and multi-dimensional exercises that Klassen went on to complete effectively, changing the face of development economics. However, even as Stefan was working on missing women, the nature of the problem was changing. Happily, with declining mortality disadvantage of the women in most regions of the world, but very unhappily with the emerge of a, an emergence of a new source of women's disadvantage in the form of sexual selective abortion of female fetuses, drawing on the increased availability of new techniques of sex discrimination of fetuses. This is the main reason why, despite a fall in the, the disadvantages that women suffer from mortality, in mortality in China and India, and in both countries, life expectancy of women is longer than that of men. Despite that, the incidence of missing women fed by selective abortion had not radically declined. Class and work makes us understand how gender inequality can be sustained by many different kinds factors coming from many different directions. Work of distinct kinds of on, uh, on, uh, on development and gender disparity has of course been well completed by Stefan Klaas. But since new questions also arise, sometimes sensibly and other times to hurried conclusion based on a puny set of under-examined data, Klassen, as the most accomplished researcher in this area, has also been playing the role of a referee, checking whether a new point is convincing or not, and deciding what is foul and what is fair. One of the more interesting cases involved whether missing women arose from hepatitis B, which came from a hypothesis which ultimately of course, exploded, including by the author and uh, the class and meanwhile had to write an article to sort out the problem. Class and may not have foreseen that being a leader of a field makes it necessary 
to have the referee's whistle in his mouth all the time. But given his accomplishment, he's not at liberty to throw the whistle away. That is the role that is imposed on him as the leading researcher in this area. Since I believe that Stefan Klaassen would have been in a leadership position in whatever area of research he chose to work on, that is not, I emphasize, a special burden that has come to him only because he has been working on gender inequality. No matter what subject, he would have had that role. Though it's possibly true that if he had been allowed, that it is possibly true that he would have been allowed more peace and solitude had he been applying computable general equilibrium models to one country after another following Bolivia. <laughs> this is the point when I thought you know, the absence of Shanta Devarajan is quite important <laughs> um, to me. By the way, he's a close friend, and, by the way, uh, and his guidance to class and work was truly brilliant, was a brilliant thesis, what I think is a trivial subject. So that's the point I'm making, and now everything else that Stefan has done since then has been totally far away from trivial subjects of any kind. Missing women was Stephen Stefan's point of entry into gender economics and into the study of human deprivation in general. He has been able to enhance our understanding of a cluster of very different development problems by making major contributions to the analysis of to choose some examples uh, as illustrations from great many more that I could have chosen. The causation of high fertility and the forces that lead to rapid fertility decline, the appreciation of what works and what does not among the proposed ways of poverty removal to the investigation of the nature and reach of public health services as well as the consequences of their neglect and the evaluation of the newly fashionable capability approach for investigating gender inequality and poverty. And um, each of these require critical evaluation, uh, and Klassen has provided that in an astonishing variety of fields. Klassen's students and colleagues have pursued many further problems including I encountered some of his, what I will say, grand students, namely his student students. Yeah. I, have, I have reached the point of great grand students, Stefan. So <laughs> I think uh, these are like grandchildren, very important to value. So I must not, um, sorry, um, uh, um, uh, no, I, sorry, I see my task here today as more of initiating a discussion um, rather than giving a long, uninterrupted lecture. There are sometimes I'm forced to do that, but today not. So I must not go on and on and look forward instead to some discussion. However, I'll take the liberty before ending of pointing to a couple of very important problems to which Stefan is rightly turning his attention at this time. The first is the linkage of women's position in society with their ability to participate in valued and remunerative employment. The, the far-reaching role of employment for women, of course, is a remarkably neglected area which needs very much more study. The fact, for example, that there has been a remarkable stagnation of female labor force partition in urban India, which Klassen has been studying with his collaborators, is extremely important for understanding the continuation of sharp gender inequality in India, despite progresses in other directions. The role of employment can not only be, not only be transformative, for example, female employment gives women a much more effective voice uh, in the direction of gender equity. It also reflects social and cultural forces that encourage or discourage 
the employment of women, especially as people's income rises. These attitudinal issues are both very important and have been peculiarly neglected in the development literature. The second point relates to the first and concerns the relevance of people's, women's and men's, understanding of the nature of social institutions and societal barriers. In one of his papers, one of his recent papers, Stefan refers to the idea of quote-unquote false consciousness that Karl Marx had talked about. The concept belongs to the study of what Marx called objective illusion. An illusion can be based on very objective observation from a certain position. And yet that positional objectivity does not indicate that the illusion is the only way of analyzing a particular problem, or indeed a very good way of understanding that problem. For example, it's not defective vision that makes people on Earth see the sun and the moon to be roughly of the same size. Indeed, anyone with a good vision on Earth will see the moon and the sun to be of similar size. But this is a position-related observation without indicating that the sun and the moon really have the same volume or identical mass. Gender discrimination survives on the basis of a set of objective illusions, which is why it is so hard to eliminate. It's not difficult to form the view, given the way society is currently organized in different parts of the world, giving particular role to men and women, that men achieve more in life than do women. It's not hard to understand why parents, including mothers as well, tend to believe in many countries that women are basically less worthy than men, which is the extraordinary feature of commonality between the mortality differential of earlier period and the, the uh, abortion of selected female fetuses today. And that happens even in countries where women's performances have dramatically improved, like in China and indeed even in Korea. In fact, all over East Asia, there's still a female deficit from the point of view of uh, uh, at, at statistics. One of the lessons from Stefan Klassen's continuing accomplishments is to appreciate first the importance of real knowledge and not just objective illusions and um, understanding in our thoughts, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it wasn't knowledge and our, uh, the uh, understanding of our thoughts. And second, the role of our thoughts in making the world what it is. You can see why it was one of Karl Marx's favorite subjects, because he was concerned with the relation between the material world and the ideas that you have, uh, the interaction between them. And of course, in that paper, which is, um, I think, a very recent, relatively recent paper, where he says, where Stefan says, there's a lot to be done on that duality of the relation between the mind and matter that we observe. And I think that is a really significant point to be pursued. I take the liberty of ending my presentation on a, I'm afraid, a rather self-centered note. I've been extremely fortunate in my long life in many different ways, from my childhood onwards in being helped by circumstances. But nothing has given me as much satisfaction as having totally outstanding students. And no one can beat Stefan Klassen in that source of joy. To see a person like Stefan Klassen change the world of understanding and initiate big social changes is certainly totally wonderful. So let me stop on that joyous note as we celebrate Stefan Klassen's 50th birthday.
So are we going to have some discussion or not? <laughs> I will take the opportunity to thank you um, in a minute more, uh, more fully. So let me now engage with you in the, uh, in the academic exchange. Um, so um, let me maybe just pick up on, on, on one issue, which um, I was trying to work on uh, in this recent paper that you talked about on gender inequality and capabilities. So um, of course, first, very clearly, um, the paper starts from um, various papers by you um, uh, as the, the person who has put together the capability approach, but also um, as a person who has worked on gender. And so one of the um, questions that was asked to do with this for a handbook on the capability that Enrica uh, Chapora is putting together is um, well, how can we measure gender inequality and capabilities? And, um, and I argue in that paper that it is actually quite difficult um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is um, that um, uh, there are various biological differences that have to be taken into account, and uh, so what exactly is the norm? Um, then um, there are um, other um, areas uh, where they are indicated for males but not for females, so there's a question how to um, deal with that. But the, where it gets a little bit more complicated, and that's where I started talking about the question of false consciousness and referred to your 1990 paper, Gender and Cooperative Conflicts, is um, when it is fairly straightforward, given the difficulties I outlined, to outline gender inequalities and functionings. But when we then start to talk about capabilities, agency becomes an important element. And, um, and uh, in and of itself, and agency, of course, um, is, uh, as you've rightly emphasized, particularly important also uh, in the gender field. But the tension that can arise, and that's, um, is what if the promotion of female agency could promote women's disadvantage? Uh, because due social customs and norms that are transmitted. Okay. What have I done? <laughs> uh, through um, social custom and social norms that yeah. uh, get transmitted, w um, women, for example, may want their uh, daughter to uh, be uh, have female uh, genital cutting, or they want their daughters to uh, not go to school, and uh, or um, and so on. So the question is: Is there a way to think about promoting agency? while at the same time not losing touch of um, looking at the inequality in, in functionings um, that are the more kind of objective ways to ask to uh, assess whether there really is a problem. And so that's what I was trying to get at. And your article in 1990 didn't mention false consciousness, but hinted at it yes. um, as uh, that uh, it may be the case that women's interests are not, uh, have been, they've been conditioned to pursue interests that are actually detrimental to their own well-being. And so the question is, can we promote female agency in those situations, uh, or what are we to do if it could undermine uh, their well-being? Yes. I, I think that it's really... Uh, can you hear me after what I was done? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, it, it's there, and that's... That's why this, I'm referring to it as not a, um, a point to be made, but a subject to be opened up. Because there is a clear relation between our valuing the agency of a person and valuing the ability of the person to marshal real knowledge as opposed to objective illusions about that. Uh, there are a lot of people you encounter who would tell you that, of course, I neglected school, etc. But if I had known what I did, I would not have done it then. And there are lots of people, and you know, great tragedies. I mean, uh, 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 my late wife died of cancer, but she was a smoker. And you know, looking back, she may well have thought that that wouldn't have been a good thing to do. 
on the other hand, it's also an agency that you have. So there is a complicated relation between knowledge, analysis, and agency. And that's what really your paper was suggesting to go into. You see, I think the, you seem to mention capability, and I've got almost no way of escaping my association with capability, merely because I started the subject in some way in the modern discussion, not in the real discussion. I and mean, Aristotle, Adam Smith, um, a lot of people have talked about them. But I could be blamed for studying in the contemporary discussion. But when I am defined, described as a capability theorist, I have to say that that I absolutely am not. Because it may turn out that capability isn't the right way of thinking about uh, many problems. Let me give you a problem where it's not. Because of biological differences, women live longer than men given identical care, medical care. If you value only capability and fairness and equality thereof, you will have to give women less care for same illnesses to make men's life expectancy and ability to live, live long catch up with that of women. Now, I think it will be hard to think that there is an ethical argument you can construct there. You simply have to violate the guidance you're getting from capability there on grounds of something like equity of people, that a man and a woman with the same illness should get the same kind of attention. So there are many values in our lives of which capability captures something. If you think about how it got to capability, that was commenting on John Rawls's theory of justice, principle not one, which is liberty, principle two, two parts of it. The second part was primary goods. I said capability would be better. That's a very small point. That doesn't make me a capability theorist, nor make me committed to giving priority to that over everything else. So I think the thing you're doing was exactly right. To ask the question, to point out, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, one of the ways uh, in which your work has been uh, novel, new, and, and pioneering is to notice that there is an issue there, there is a problem there, not yet uh, addressed. And this is important pedagogically. You first see it as a, as a, as a problem, as a contradiction, as, as something which is not fitting in. If, you, if your inclination is to avoid that, then you're finished. Your inclination has to be to nurture it and then proceed, which is what you did in your thesis and so on. So similarly here, the agency point you're raising and its connection with false consciousness uh, is, uh, or more generally, objective illusion, uh, is really extraordinarily important. I mean, there is, it's so difficult really to understand, uh, for example, that um, why in, say, China, and for quite a while in South Korea, where women really do extremely well compared with uh, women in many other parts of the world, like my part of the world, like South Asia, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, compared with that. And why is it that the sex-specific abortion is actually larger in China than in any of the South Asian countries? It's least in Bangladesh among the South Asian countries. In India, it divides into two halves, north and west, as a, a lot of it, south and east doesn't. And Pakistan, there is a lot of it, but not as high as China. Why is it? Uh, uh, and uh, certainly, Chinese women uh, enjoy greater freedom and make greater achievement than, uh, than uh, Indian uh, uh, Pakistani women may do. So there are real tension there. What is, what is the issue there? And uh, we have to study it. So I think what you're doing is opening up a field rather than making a point there. Anyone? Uh, 
it seems everyone is shy. Uh, I, I would like to make a ask a question both of you because both of you study the gender inequality and also uh, one graduated from or working in the Harvard University. There's a big issue, big issue in Harvard uh, that is the former president Larry Summers. He's also uh, he is also an economist because he made some we I, we said that stupid comments about the the female female scientists on the end of performance of in science. So then go back to this question. So maybe this is politically incorrect. So could you give us some politically correct explain explanation to this? Uh, the under uh, representation or under performance of the female science scientists in the academia. Thank you. You were involved with the Larry Summers dispute, so maybe you want to go first. Uh, I have an opinion about that too, but. Uh... Yeah, I see that that statement of Larry Summers has got some wide um, publicity. Uh, not entirely um, fairly, I think, um, because um, I think that remark that Larry made indicated a mistake of um, communication rather than what he was trying to say, because he was being, and this is why things like computable general equilibrium worries me so much. That is, you exhaust everything. And he said, there could be four possibilities. Could be that women are innately, why there are so few women scientists? Could be that women are worse at science. It's maybe some intrinsic biological reason. Could be that they're taught to be worse in science and therefore never given, just the same way women in Victorian age Girls, talented girls doing painting would be asked to do watercolor rather than oil painting. It could be that society discriminates people. He went on and on. This was one of the hypotheses. This is not the only thing that he was saying. So that is what I would say was the primary failure was to not see the occasion. The occasion was how to build up more women in, 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 in science and to give all the hypothesis, and he, there's nothing to indicate he fully believed that. Now, there comes the second question, did he believe that or not? That it is a, is it a pure theoretical possibility, or is it something which he thought could possibly be true? I don't know the answer to this question, but since uh, you know, I know him reasonably well, I would be surprised that he actually did think that that's very likely, I don't know. But on that, I keep an open mind. But the technique of doing every possibility uh, and say it could be one, it could be this, it could be that, and you show your analytical muscle by having thought of all possibilities. But it certainly gave um, um, uh, poor uh, Larry a very tough time. But I, I think the question you are asking could be better understood if you dissociate it from Larry. Some people do believe, and society in a sense do believe, that uh, it's more important to create a scientific opportunities for men, talented men, than, uh, than women. Now, it's not true of Europe any longer, though it, it's to some extent still may be true in some more complicated way. And it's increasingly less true in the United States, but it is true of many countries in the world, enormously more true. And I think this is where the false consciousness and objective illusion I think comes up. You don't see women scientists very much. As a result, you tend to think that this is a subject that they don't do, they do other things. Now, from the, rather than asking why is it uh, that they don't do it, and what is the society's role in it. If you form a view about women's lack of um, intrinsic ability to do science, then you're going on the false consciousness route. But then you could persuade yourself lots of things on that basis. Uh, 
say, I'm not saying this is necessarily true, but it is, seems to be true, etc., etc. The usual locution of making uh, unacceptable point acceptably, that is something that society teaches you very early in, in, in life. So I think what we have to do is exactly the issue with which I was trying to end, quoting um, Stefan, to have much greater study, systematic study, of why these objective illusions are created. I had no opportunity of developing that illusion because um, at 18 I developed oral cancer and I was treated by radiation. Uh, a subject which was immensely advanced by Madame Curie not long earlier, and in a hospital that was opened in Calcutta by Madame Curie's daughter. Uh, and, and I was the fourth case of radiation there. So it was quite clear that but for Madame Curie, I may not be alive now. But that's the kind of exceptional realization. I, I can't say I was lucky to have cancer at that time, but in that respect, it was good to have that understanding instilled in one, that when it comes to really world-shattering changes, it's not even the case that women have not done as much. It's really in terms of general numbers that may still be true. So I think this is a really big subject. You know, I personally think ultimately development economics is not a different subject from economics. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I don't think I've taught development economics ever in my life, actually. Uh, because I see it as a part of economics, but it is generally an economic problem in which development economics have a particular role to play because by bringing in countries, in many different stages of, um, you know, uh, uh, economic and social and indeed educational and scientific advancement, you bring out sharp differences which you may not be able to see if you concentrate the attention only on problems that are relevant in Europe and America. You may miss out reality of something in Europe by not studying non-European countries in this context, because you can ask the question, does that in any way apply in Germany? In what way does it apply? Uh, and so on. Well, let me also uh, just say a couple of words on that. So they, um, just for everybody to remember, maybe not many of you do remember what the controversy was exactly. So Larry Summers, the president of Harvard, he went, he went to a conference at Harvard about how to promote um, female scientists, and um, he mentioned all the possibilities why there are so few, and then he did expand a little bit more on this one that um, maybe they are less qualified. And so, um, although he didn't take the position that that's necessarily his view, but he and the, the argument he made was the following: he basically said, "Look, um, there are all these studies about IQ." And it is the case that the average IQ of males and females is around the same, but the distribution of males is wider and narrower among females. And uh, so then, this was the first assumption that he made, um, was um, that uh, in order to be a tenured faculty in uh, physics or chemistry or mathematics, uh, you must be three standard deviations on the right of that distribution. Um, and he said, well, if there are these distributions are unequal, there are just more men who are on three standard deviations to the right of the, of the median. And so it's not surprising, or so that view goes, which he didn't say necessarily was his own. So it would not be surprising that you see more um, uh, males and females. So my take on that is, um, first, uh, to, uh, I agree with Marty, I think mostly, of course, it was a communication issue, um, if you, you can actually, I think, still read his presentation on the internet. He, I think, was not well prepared. He had just come with a few notes. Uh, and then he was just thinking about the topic aloud at a particular uh, conference where um, it was about promoting female scientists. And um, so that was um, the communication problem. Um, 
in addition, I think there is a, a substantive issue because he made two assumptions. One is, of course, that these IQ tests and gender difference in IQ are very hard facts. And that's, of course, a debate among lots of people whether they are very hard facts about that this distribution is a, a different or whether it's just a different ways how these IQ tests are done or how people are, uh, that their uh, males do better in some ways and worse in others and so on. Um, so that, that was assumption number one. Assumption number two was that um, every physics, chemistry, and math professor is indeed one of the three standard deviations to the right on the intelligence distribution. That's an untested hypothesis. Uh, um, so one could have, of course, uh, made that test. My suspicion is that's not the case. I think, um, uh, of course, one has to be very bright to uh, be uh, uh, to be a, a tenure professor in natural sciences, but it takes a lot of skills. It takes social skills. It takes skills of uh, creativity and originality, uh, it takes hard, uh, perseverance, a whole bunch of skills um, that may or may not be correlated with your intelligence. So in that sense, I think um, uh, he was making some assumptions um, at the wrong time, in front of the wrong audience, um, that uh, I think uh, led to this predicament. Um, um, Amartya, you spoke at length about uh, Stefan's contributions to the question of missing women and gender equality generally. But there are many other areas in which he has contributed, yeah, yeah. including on global poverty estimates, inclusivity of growth and development, how to conceptualize it and measure it, uh, labor markets and when they function well or not, many policy applications in specific contexts from South Africa to, uh, to India to Latin America. And of course, he's worked in policy institutions such as the World Bank. So I wonder if you could comment a bit on the ways in which you think your own concerns and themes have uh, informed Stefan's work or vice versa uh, in the time in which you have, have known him in those other areas uh, in which he has also uh, researched and influenced uh, many people, including myself. Thank you. When someone asks a question of such enormous expanse, my first counter question usually is to say, how much time do you have? <laughs> because it will take time, because he's written in so many different areas. No, I think, um, um, no, you're absolutely right there. I could have talked about a completely different aspect of Stefan's work. But, you know, I think um, I'm, um, uh, and uh, it's with, especially given this gathering and today and the interests of the, uh, of, of the people already expressed. I, I think probably it would be a mistake to try to go into to, to these general things. But I think what uh, Sanjay is saying is really important, that even though I've emphasized certain things of uh, Stefan's work, that's not necessarily the, the, not only, it's definitely not the only thing you've done, but it's also not, as some people, people might dispute whether that is the most important thing you've done. To some extent, I think you're raising that question. I think I would like to note that point rather than give you another lecture on the coming, over the coming 45 minutes <laughs> on that subject. Uh, but it is an important point to note, yeah. Um, 